This is the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth quarter, 2020. Lesson 2 for October 3 to 9, ready for teaching on Sabbath, October 10. The Family, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, October 3. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you once again this week and thank you that as families we can come to you, as individuals we can come to you, as those who are single, those who are widowed, those who are divorced, those who just want to come and talk with you and live their lives in alignment with your will, and those who want to accept the salvation that is offered through the vicarious death of Jesus for each one of us. We come to you today and ask that as we open your word, that not only will we be blessed, but that the things we learn will help us in our relationship with those about us. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8. My son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. Let's read that again. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8. My son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. As human beings, we are always ideally learning. In fact, Life itself is a school. As Ellen White wrote in The Desire of Ages, page 69, From the earliest times the faithful in Israel had given much care to the education of the youth. The Lord had directed that even from babyhood the children should be taught of his goodness and his greatness, especially as revealed in his law and shown in the history of Israel. Song and prayer and lessons from the scriptures were to be adapted to the opening mind. Fathers and mothers were to instruct their children that the law of God is an expression of his character, and that as they received the principles of the law into the heart, the image of God was traced on mind and soul. Much of the teaching was oral, but the youth also learned to read the Hebrew writings and the parchment rolls of the Old Testament scriptures were open to their study. End of quote. For most of human history, education took place mostly in the home, especially for the early years. What does the Bible say about education in the family? And what principle can we take away from it for ourselves whatever our family situation happens to be. Sunday, October 4. The First Family. We haven't been given many details, none really, in the initial pages of Scripture regarding the kind of family education that went on in the earliest days of human history, though we can be sure that it was in the family structure itself that education took place back then. As we read in the book Education, page 33, the system of education established in Eden centred in the family, Adam was the son of God, as it says in Luke 3.38, and it was from their father that the children of the highest received instruction. Theirs, in the truest sense, was a family school. End of quote. And though we don't know exactly what was taught, we may be sure that it dealt with the wonders of creation and, after sin, the plan of redemption. Question, what do the following texts teach? And why would they surely have been part of the education that Adam and Eve imparted to their children? Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 15, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, Luke 10, 27, Galatians 3, 11, and Revelation 22, verse 12. Let's read those verses. It's going to be a long haul, but stay with us because the story is so great. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. 
and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself, on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light, on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Then God said, Let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded, according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning, with a fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth a living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, And indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And chapter 2 of Genesis. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because in it he rested from all his work which God had created 
and made. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bdellium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hidakel, and it is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And Genesis chapter 3, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, 
and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And Luke 10, 27, So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbour as yourself. And Galatians 3, verse 11, But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And Revelation chapter 22 And verse 12, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. In the book Education, page 20, we read, The system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model for man throughout all after time. As an illustration of its principles, a model school was established in Eden, the home of our first parents. End of quote. Christian education is a commitment to educating families and members in doctrine, worship, instruction, fellowship, evangelism and service. Home is where you minister to family members about the love and promises of God. It is where Jesus is introduced to children as their Lord and Saviour and friend, and where the Bible is upheld as the Word of God. Family is where you model what a healthy relationship with your Heavenly Father looks like. In Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, we have both Cain and Abel bringing their offerings to the Lord. Let's read that. Genesis 4, beginning at verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. We surely can assume that they learned about the meaning and importance of the offerings as part of their family education regarding the plan of salvation. Of course, as the story shows... A good education doesn't always lead to the kind of outcome that one would hope for. So, to finish today, whatever your home situation is, what choices can you make in order for it to be an environment where truth is taught and lived out? Monday, October 5, The Childhood of Jesus Scripture gives us very little detail about the childhood of Jesus. Much from those years remains a mystery. However, we have been given some insight into the character of his earthly parents, Mary and Joseph, and what we learn about them could help explain to us something of his childhood and early education. Question. What do these texts teach us about Mary and Joseph, and how might they give us insight into how Jesus had been educated by his parents? Luke 1, verses 26 to 38. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee 
named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And, having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favoured one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But, When she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David." and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God." Now indeed Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And then in Luke 1, verses 46 to 55, called the Song of Mary. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Saviour, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers to Abraham and his seed forever, and Matthew 1, verses 18 to 24. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But, While he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife. Through these texts, we can see that both Mary and Joseph were faithful Jews, seeking to live in obedience to the laws and commandments of God, and indeed, when the Lord came to them and told them about what was going to happen with them, they faithfully did all that they were told. As we read in The Desire of Ages, page 70, the child Jesus did not receive instruction in the synagogue schools. His mother was his first human teacher. From her lips, and from the scrolls of the prophets, he learned of heavenly things. The very words which he himself had spoken to Moses for Israel, he was now taught at his mother's knee. As he advanced from childhood to youth, he did not seek the schools of the rabbis. He needed not the education to be obtained from such sources, for God was his instructor. End of quote. No doubt they were good and faithful teachers to the child, 
But, as the story in Luke 2, 41-50 reveals, there was much about their son that they did not understand, because Jesus had knowledge and wisdom that had been imparted to him only by the Lord. Let's read about that in Luke 2, verses 41 to 50. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was twelve years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, seeking him. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. So to finish the day, read again the Ellen G. White quote above. How do we wrap our minds around what she wrote here about how Jesus learned at his mother's knee the words that he himself had spoken? What does this tell us about the amazing love of God? How should we, fallen and sinful creatures, respond? Desire of Ages, page 70. The child Jesus did not receive instruction in the synagogue schools. His mother was his first human teacher. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophets, he learned of heavenly things. The very words which he himself had spoken to Moses for Israel, he was now taught at his mother's knee. As he advanced from childhood to youth, he did not seek the schools of the rabbis. He needed not the education to be obtained from such sources, for God was his instructor. End of quote. Tuesday, October 6. Communication. In a very real sense, education at any level is communication. The teacher is the one who has knowledge, wisdom, information, facts, whatever, to convey to the student. Someone filled with a lot of knowledge must be able to communicate it to others, otherwise, what good is all that he or she knows, at least in terms of teaching? At another level, however, good teaching skills are not just the ability to communicate. Also crucial to the whole process is the building of a relationship. As we read in Education, page 212, the true teacher can impart to his pupils few gifts so valuable as the gift of his own companionship. It is true of men and women, and how much more of youth and children, that only as we come in touch through sympathy can we understand them, and we need to understand in order most effectively to benefit. End of quote. In other words, good teaching works on the emotional and personal level as well. In the case of the family, as a school, this is so very important. A good relationship must be built between the student and teacher. Relationships are established and developed by means of communication. When Christians do not communicate with God, such as by reading the Bible or in prayer, their relationship with God stagnates. Families need divine guidance if they are to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Question. Read the following texts. What can we learn from them about how to build strong family relationships or any kind of relationship for that matter? Psalm 37 verses 7 to 9. 
Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. And Proverbs 10 verses 31 and 32. The mouth of the righteous brings forth wisdom, but the perverse tongue will be cut out. The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked, what is perverse? And Proverbs 27 verse 17, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And Ephesians 4, verse 15, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. And 1 John three eighteen, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And then Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. And James 4, 11, Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But... If you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Taking the time to sow the proper seeds of communication will not only prepare family members for a personal relationship with Christ, but also help to develop interpersonal relationships within the family. It will open up channels of communication that you will be glad you formed once your children reach puberty and adulthood. And, even if you don't have children, the principles found in these texts can work for all kinds of relationships. So to finish today, think too about why it is not just what we say that is so important, but how we say it. What have you learned from situations in which the way you said something pretty much ruined the impact of what you had said, even if what you said was correct? Wednesday, October 7. The Role of Parents And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians 6 verse 4. And Proverbs 31 verse 10 reads, Who can find a virtuous wife, for her worth is far above rubies? Parents have an awesome responsibility. The father is the head of the family, and the family is the nursery of church, school, and society. If the father is weak, irresponsible, and incompetent, then the family, church, and school, and society will suffer the consequences. Fathers should seek to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5.22 and 23. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Mothers, too, have perhaps the most important role in all society. They have great influence in shaping the characters of their children and establishing the mood and temperament of the home. Fathers should do all they can to work with the mothers in the education of their children. Question. What can fathers and mothers learn from these texts? Ephesians five twenty two and 23 Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, and also Christ is head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. And the same chapter, verses 25 and 26 Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. And 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3 But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, 
the head of woman is man and the head of Christ is God. And 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And Romans 13 verses 13 and 14, Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfil its lusts. And 2 Peter 1, verses 5-7 to But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. And... Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Christian parents have a moral obligation to provide a biblical model of Christ and the Church by their behaviour. The marriage relationship is an analogy of Christ's relationship to the church. When parents refuse to lead, or if they lead in a tyrannical manner, then they are painting a false picture of Christ for their own children and for the world. God commands all Christian parents to diligently teach their children, as we read in Deuteronomy 6 verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Parents have the responsibility to teach their children to love the Lord with their whole heart. They are to teach the fear of the Lord, a total loving devotion and submission to Him. In Deuteronomy 6 verse 7, the children of Israel were given specific instructions about educating their children in regard to the great things the Lord had done for His people. However great a story the elders had to tell their children, we who live after the cross of Christ have a much better one to tell, don't we? Thus, the healing or training we are to give is an ongoing proactive event in which we pour the truth of God into our children and prepare them for their own relationship with Christ. In the end, though, we all have been given the sacred gift of free will. Ultimately, When they are adults, our children will have to answer for themselves before God. Thursday, October 8 lest ye forget. Before the children of Israel were to enter into the promised land, Moses spoke to them again, recounting the wonderful ways that the Lord had led them, and he admonished them again and again not to forget what the Lord had done for them. In many ways, Deuteronomy was Moses' last will and testament. And though written thousands of years ago, in a culture and life situation radically different from anything we face today, the principles there apply to us as well. Question. Read Deuteronomy chapter 6. What can we learn from this chapter about the principles of Christian education? What should be central to all that we teach, not just to our children, but to anyone who doesn't know what we know about God and His great acts of salvation? What warnings are found in these verses as well? Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. 
Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So it shall be. When the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of all good things which you did not fill, hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, when you have eaten and are full, then beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him, and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you, and that you may go in and possess the good land of which the Lord swore to your fathers, to cast out all your enemies from before you, as the Lord has spoken." When your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is the meaning of the testimonies, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders before our eyes, great and severe, against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all his household. Then he brought us out from there, that he might bring us in, to give us the land of which he swore to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Then it will be righteousness for us, if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us. So central to all that they were to teach their children was the marvellous working of God among them. Also, how clearly was the warning given not to forget all that God had done for them. Of course, if parents are to play the first major role in integrating biblical teachings into their children's lives, then they have a responsibility to organise and prepare their own lives in such a manner that they have adequate knowledge of and time to spend with their children. Ellen White writes in Education, page 275, The child's first teacher is the mother. During the period of greatest susceptibility and most rapid development, his education is to a great degree in her hands. End of quote. This is the essential time when parents minister to their children about the love and promises of God. Designating a regularly scheduled time to teach the wisdom and promises of God personally to your children will positively impact your family for generations to come. And so to finish today, read this text again, Deuteronomy 6 verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. What is the point here, and what should it tell us about how crucial it is always to keep the reality of the Lord before not just our children, but our own selves as well?
Friday, October 9. From the book Education, page 276, we read, Upon fathers as well as mothers rests a responsibility for the child's earlier as well as its later training, and for both parents the demand for careful and thorough preparation is most urgent. Before taking upon themselves the possibilities of fatherhood and motherhood, men and women should become acquainted with the laws of physical development. They should also understand the laws of mental development and moral training. End of quote. And from the same book, page 283, we read, The work of cooperation should begin with the father and the mother themselves in the home life. In the training of their children, they have a joint responsibility, and it should be their constant endeavour to act together. Let them yield themselves to God, seeking help from Him to sustain each other. Parents who give this training are not the ones likely to be found criticising the teacher. They feel that both the interest of their children and the justice to the school demand that, so far as possible, they sustain and honour the one who shares their responsibility. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, whether we have children or not, we all exist in some sort of domicile and we all interact with others as well. What have you learned from this week's lesson that can help you in interacting with or even witnessing to others, whether in the place where you live or elsewhere? 2. We tend to view education as a good thing. After all, who can be against education? But is this always the case? What might be examples of educations having been perverted and turned into something bad? What can we learn from those negative examples that could help us make education a good thing? 3. As stated in Wednesday's study, we all have been given the sacred gift of free will. Sooner or later, when children become young adults or even adults, they will have to make their own decisions regarding the God whom they have been taught about all their young lives. Why must all parents, and anyone really, who seek to witness to others and to teach others the gospel, always keep in mind this crucial truth about free will. Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Australian Risks All in Africa and it's by Vanea Cho. Etienne McClintock, 51, wasn't taking anything for granted in Ethiopia. The 3ABN Australia radio host was preaching in Shisho, a rural town located 20 miles or 35 kilometres from Owasa, the second biggest city in Ethiopia, as part of the 2019 total member involvement meetings organised by the East Central Africa Division. Electricity was intermittent, and he spent the first two nights presenting in the dark. Despite the technical challenges, more than 400 people were attending the outdoor meetings. The crowd was far bigger than the church could handle, and ATN was preaching from a makeshift shelter with plastic sheets for a roof. ATN was worried as he prepared for the third meeting. Although a rented generator provided power, rain began to fall just 30 minutes before opening time. He hoped people wouldn't be deterred from attending. The rain stopped by the beginning of the meeting, but rain clouds filled the sky. Adrian was barely 15 minutes into his sermon when the rain started. As the downpour intensified, people left the meeting. Although Adrian had some protection in his makeshift shelter, his audience was sitting in the open air. The church elders and I had prayed for the rain to stay away, and now the rain had come back, ATN recalled. We had to do something. But what? Suddenly it came to him. Every evening he had been sharing about God's power over sickness, sin and death. But God also had power over the weather. 
He could pray for the rain to stop. But what if God chose not to stop the rain? His message would lose credibility and people might stop attending. At that moment, 1 John 5.14 flashed into Atian's mind. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Atian prayed silently, Lord, I believe, but please help my unbelief. Through his interpreter, he invited the audience to pray with him for the rain to stop. Moments after he said Amen, the rain stopped. It didn't rain again for the rest of the program. After the sermon, about 200 people came to the front to ask for prayer. There were people kneeling everywhere, Atien said. As we knelt in the dirt, we prayed a prayer of thanksgiving and dedication to God. Seeing half of the audience kneeling on the ground, Atien remembered his family and friends praying for his meetings in Australia. He thanked God for their prayers. God gave me a new experience, he said. Up until that point in my life, I took low risks with God with low rewards. This was the high risk that made me feel uncomfortable and vulnerable. But the reward was amazing. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.